Good morning, Hope Reform Baptist Church. It's good to be here. Open your Bibles up to the book of Hebrews. This is our first uh, iteration of a series that I trust will take us well over a year, a, a rich study in this book, in this epistle. Uh, it, it's, to study Hebrews, you end up studying the whole Bible because the book of Hebrews touches on, on every section and main literary uh, uh, portion of the Old Testament. It speaks to the life of Jesus and the, it, it uh, touches on themes from the other epistles in the New Testament. So you study the book of Hebrews, you study in the whole Bible. It also touches all of the main heads of like doctrine or theology. It's going to touch on uh, the actual very being and nature and persons and triunity and the perfections of God himself. That's theology proper. It's going to talk about revelation, how God makes himself known to us. It's going to talk about anthropology or mankind. What is, what is man? What is our relationship to God? And what is our deepest problem? That leads us into harmatology. What is sin? Uh, what is our, our problem? Why are we disconnected and, and um, uh, alienated from God? And that leads us into soteriology, the doctrine of salvation. How do we find atonement? What are we saved from and what are we saved to? What are we saved through? Hebrews answers that. It talks about the church and the nature of the new covenant as well and who should be considered those who are, are God's people. And then it touches on uh, eschatology, the kingdom of God, and pneumatology, the Holy Spirit. All of these things will be touched on. I, I assure you, as we walk our way through the book of Hebrews. Now, here's my introductory warning. I, wrote, I read multiple commentators who said this, as, as you got to preach, preach Hebrews, pastors, do not preach Hebrews until you have already preached all the way through the book of Leviticus. So, the bad news might sound like I'm about to say, and be honest, that'd be bad news. If we went, all right, 10-week study, 20-week study, book, book of Leviticus today. If you don't know why that's a, a, a hard study, you haven't read Leviticus. Go and read it. Uh, but, but maybe I could submit to you that somebody had enough foresight and forethought and wise planning that instead of leading you through a studies, study on the book of Leviticus, he would just lead you on a study about the themes of Leviticus called the blood of Jesus. Could such a man exist with that amount of foresight? Uh, he may. He's not in this room because I didn't plan that. The Lord is uh, wise in his providence and his planning. And we've just finished in the evenings. I encourage you, go watch this on YouTube. Uh, the, a study on the blood of Jesus and how the Old Testament themes of sacrifices are preached in the New Testament. Now, we're coming to the book of Hebrews and all of those themes are going to be extremely helpful. Understanding the day of atonement, the priesthood, the sacrifices, the temple, the altar, etc. and etc. to God's glory. So, uh, uh, to study Hebrews is a, is, a, a, is a big task. We praise God for the call he puts on us right in this moment to do so. So look at Hebrews chapter 1. I'm going to read the first uh, four verses of chapter 1 and then we'll duck into 3 and 4 as well. This is what the one true living God says to us in his word. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. Now look at Hebrews 4, verse 12. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. May God bless this word in our midst this morning. I'm going to pray over us before we start this series. Father God, we thank you for this book. Your Holy Spirit has 
written it through uh, the pens and the hands and the voices of mere mortal men back in ages past. And we thank you that having written it, Holy Spirit, you are now present to help us understand it. Please open our hearts to understand how this points to you. Open our hearts to be saved if we have not yet placed our faith in Jesus and open our hearts to understand the breadth and the interconnectedness of Scripture so that we can understand it to your glory and our great joy. We pray all of this in Jesus' wonderful name. And everybody said? Amen. When I was a young boy... I, was, uh, I was, had the blessing and the privilege of being raised in a Christian home. And one of the uh, readings that I would do uh, uh, in my uh, uh, Bible as a kid was in and through portions of the Old Testament. And I love reading the Old Testament. I had, it wasn't quite a pop-up book, but it was a picture book. As a young kid, about 10 or, 10 or so, there was these uh, beautiful illustrations of the tabernacle. Always amazed me. But the ones that I really loved <coughs> were these illustrations that were there of Solomon's temple and then the second temple, which was built after the Jews came back into Israel. And as a young boy, I, I just thought, and I dreamed, I loved the fact that at some point, I'm going to grow up, I'm going to get old enough, and I'm going to be able to get on a plane and go and see this for myself. Not a, not, not a Veggie Tales cartoon astro. I'm going to see it. I'm going to, I'm going to touch the place where God dwelt. I'm going to see the place where Jesus preached. I'm going to see the altar that the lambs were sacrificed on. And, and I could just imagine, probably superstitiously, like there was some historical insight of that's amazing, what a sight. There was also the spiritual superstition. If I could just touch it, imagine how easy it would be to pray there. Imagine how much holier I would come back to Australia having touched the altar, seen the holy place, looked upon the temple in all of its glory. I will, I will have a, a shining face as I come back to my loser friends who didn't see the glories that I beheld. And it was shock and horror. Some of you know where this is going because you know your history and biblical history well enough. It was only a few years later that having read the study portions in that same Bible, I learned that the temple doesn't exist. Now, I'm, kids, I'm, one, I'm, I'm saving you the, the heartache that I went through. You can't go visit it, not because Qantas doesn't fly to Israel or because the tours are too expensive. You can't visit the temple because it doesn't exist. The temple is gone. The pagan general Titus uh, besieged Jerusalem in AD 70, 70 uh, years after the birth of Jesus, besieged it, uh, marched into it, breached the walls, killed hundreds of thousands, they reckon possibly up to a million uh, uh, Jews who were defending for their city and fighting for their holy land. They breached the Temple Mount, they burned it down, they destroyed and took down every brick to fulfill the prophecy of Jesus, which said, that for their, adult, their, their blasphemous adultery and idolatry, the Lord would tear down this temple brick by brick. That was shock to me. I couldn't visit it. Now, at that point, it was not much more significant than that, but I really wanted to visit it. Now, let's track back, though. Uh, uh, imagine that I'm not particularly unique, and this has been a, a conception or a thought for people throughout history. Maybe the 1400s as a Catholic, maybe a teenage boy, or, or maybe a priest in his, in his training, and, and he's reading the Old Testament, and, and he's, you know, he's doing his is, uh, is uh, the, the pilgrimages, and he went to the Vatican. Right? He went to Rome, he saw the papal city, and he, he went back home to, you know, in Lyons of France or in Londinium, wherever it was that, that he went back home to. And he thought, the big one, no, I'm ready for I went to Rome, but the big one, I want to go to Jerusalem and touch the temple. Imagine how, imagine how distraught he would be to find out, no, it was destroyed. No pilgrimage to do, to go and touch the holy gold and see it. If, if you want to travel, you can just go to Rome and see the Arch of Titus, which was built by his brother, Emperor Domitian, who uh, uh, after Titus's victory over, uh, over Israel, uh, he had this beautiful memorial done of a tragic event. There's, there's carvings, there's uh, uh, relief pictures all over these pillars and of, of the Romans destroying, slaughtering Israelites and burning their temple. That's as close as you can get. I wonder if maybe, maybe earlier, back in like medieval ages, there's a monastic monk somewhere and he's in the mountains and he's not talking to people. And he's got a vow of science and he's fasting uh, and he's doing all of these to try and get years off purgatory. And then he's reading the Old Testament and he goes, the temple, of course, if I go and fast and pray at the temple and sit silently and do my mantras at the temple, then I'll, then I'll, I'll really supercharge my spiritual ability and knock years, maybe millennia, off my purgatory. What a hopeful young man, distraught to find out there's no temple. 
you can't go to it. But what if we go all the way back to, say, 72 AD? And there's young uh, uh, Nithaniel, and he was raised in Alexandria in a Hebrew Jewish family in one of the, the, uh, the, the Jewish uh, uh, communities that was down there in North Africa. And uh, imagine he, after his grandparents converted to believe upon Jesus Christ and are now going to church and whatnot, but still having been raised in the Jewish tradition, he, uh, he's reading Tanakh and he's, you know, he sees all these stories about the temple and he asks his dad, Dad, can we go up north to Israel, the land of our forefathers? I want to see the temple. Of Solomon. His father would tell him, I'm sorry, I didn't inform you beforehand. That was, that was destroyed 600 years ago. The, the, the Babylonians burned that one down. But there was a second one. Oh, Dad, Abba, Daddy, take me to that one. Let's go on a, let's go on a travel to the Jerusalem and see the second temple. Oh, he would have to tell him. A year ago, the Romans marched in and destroyed. There's nothing to go visit anymore. Not only historical insight or interest sparks Christians or people to want to go to the temple and find out it's not there, but also tragically, uh, this was the case for me as a young kid and many Christians actually sadly, um, there is also a spiritual superstition, a kind of a feeling that if I just go there, I I touch it, I, I see it, I pray at that wall. Some people get baptized for a second, third, fourth or fifth time in the River Jordan because that's where Jesus got baptized. So it's really holy water. People have this kind of idea, this mindset that is wrong, a spiritual superstition that goes, if I touch a certain place or see it, there will be, a, there will be a, an increased access to God. I mean, that's where he dwelt. That's where the sacrifices were made. That's where Jesus lived. I mean, this is, this is big and this is significant. And, and it is one thing after eighty seventy to say to people, like, it's not even an argument. I don't need to convince Christians these days, don't go and worship at the temple. You don't need to. I, I don't need to make that argument. I don't make that argument. Just inform you, it's, there's nothing to go to. The case, though, was very different between 33 AD when Jesus went to heaven and 70 AD when those walls came tumbling down. There was an entire 37-year, about 40-year generation where Jesus had died and been raised again. He was ascended up into heaven 40 days later, AD 33, thereabouts. 40 days later, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down and birthed the church. And then from that point, for the entire first generation of the church, one whole generation, the church's first generation, that temple still stood and represented a kind of temptation to go back to access God through a way that did not hold superior or even valid standing in a spiritual sense anymore. And the argument, it feels like we've got the stronger argument now. We can just say, temptation done, the building's down. It feels like maybe a weaker argument for Paul before the destruction of the temple to say, don't go back, it's not valid, don't go through it. Is that a weaker argument? Actually, the existence of that temple still standing Yet Paul and other New Testament writers saying it's not the center of our religion, though still standing, actually makes that a more powerful argument. You see, because the basis of not needing the temple or not doing a pilgrimage to the temple or not accessing God via the temple and the whole Old Testament system that it represented, the argument against doing that is not based on the fact that Titus destroyed the building in AD 70. It's that God crucified his son and rose him back to life, establishing him as the eternal temple in AD 33. That's the grounds of the uh, uh, moving on of God's purposes and plan. That's the grounds that you don't need to go to a building. You don't need to resurrect Old Testament systems. As Jesus himself said, this temple is very cute. I'm paraphrasing. He says, though, destroy this temple, speaking of his body, and in three days I will rise it up again. That is the grounds of our confidence. That is the grounds of the New Testament theology that says you don't need to go back to the temple. It doesn't uh, hold out positives for us spiritually anymore because God has invested his presence, not in the holy place, but in Jesus. The place where he meets man, not in the holy place, but in Jesus. The sacrifice for sins, not on the altar, but in Jesus. The true knowledge and revelation of God's mystery for mankind, not in the uh, rabbinic teachings, but in Jesus. We need him and we need nothing more. This is the main theme of the book of Hebrews. (coughs) And his main point really becomes that Jesus is superior. 
Jesus is superior. In the, uh, we're going to do some historical and theological sort of contextual uh, uh, introduction to this book. Uh, in those years, now we, we, need to, we need to understand this. It was not a sin for a Christian, maybe saved Pentecost or one of those years following. It was not a sin for a Hebrew born, a traditionally trained, Old Testament informed Jew, having believed upon Jesus Christ, to then go to temple. That's not a sin. We see the apostles doing it in Acts chapter 3 and following. That They're going up to the temple to pray. They just understand this whole Old Testament system now in the light of Jesus. They worship Jesus. Then they preach Jesus in the temple. So that's not a sin. That's not the problem. The problem is that in God's providence and in the development of history, a going to temple instead of church became a way to hide from Christian persecution and hide within the broader context of the Jewish nation. Two things really drove that, uh, th that tendency. One of them was, was basically this. In the Roman Empire, stretching basically from Britain round to South Asia in India, that marvelous, enormous empire, uh, the Romans conquered and they, they enforced religious Toleration, toleration and pluralism. So in other words, the Romans would come in and say, you worship your Celtic gods, it's cute, that's fine. You worship your Germanic gods, that's cute, that's fine. You worship your ancient Eastern gods, that's cute, that's fine. But you must tack Caesar on top of that and add with him the Roman play Roma of gods. That's all. So worship yours and worship ours because we just beat you in war, so sucks being losers. That was, their, that was their social, one of their methods of taking over. There was, however, one group, one nation, one religious group in all of the Roman Empire who had put up such a fight for their monotheism, for their claim that not just our God plus your gods, but our God alone and no other God beside him. And that was the, 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 I almost said island, the nation of Israel. The Jews had learned their lesson from their exile. They'd learned their lesson from the Babylonian captivity. Stop worshipping other gods beside me in my temple. So they fought wars through the Maccabees and others. They fought wars and defences and revolts to throw out the Romans and the Greeks from, from a, a, a putrefying and defiling their temple. They kept it holy. They died for it. And eventually the Romans said, it's just, it's not worth the coin we're spending. Let them worship their God. They have approved, wherever they go in the empire, Jews need not worship Caesar. Jews need not worship the Pleroma of Roman gods. They and they alone get the monotheistic uh, religious freedoms card stamped onto their wallet. They and they alone. Now, as Jews were getting converted, and in the early generations, the converts to the Christian faith were majority Jews, Tens of thousands of uh, Jerusalem-centered, then Antiochians, and all throughout Judea and Samaria. They were mostly Jews converting. It was the later decades that then the door swung open to the Gentiles through Paul's mission to the Gentiles in Acts 13 and onwards. But in those early decades, the Romans would, of course, look upon Christians as just a denomination of Judaism. And so they had the agreed-upon religious freedom. But as the traditional... Uh, erroneous uh, Jews, unbelieving Jews, started to push and press out the Christians from their midst and say, you're committing blasphemy, worshipping a man, a carpenter, who died a naked death on a cross. You're worshipping him as God and Messiah. Get out of here. They would press and push them out because the Christians were stirring up trouble all over the Roman Empire, saying there's a Lord above Caesar. Shh, stop doing that. Getting bad press. The Jews would press them out as the Romans continued up in their heat and persecution to want to persecute these Christ followers. And once the Jewish, the, 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 the unbelieving Jews made clear the Christians aren't one of us, what did the Christians lose? They lost their religious freedoms. They lost their jet, get out of jail free card. And so to the Romans, especially with Nero and his heightened incestuous, strange, demonic mind. Uh, we'll get into that in future sermons. That turned vehemently upon the Christians and, uh, uh, and were taking them down because they've now realized these Christians aren't just one of the Jews. The Jews don't like them. The temptation arose then for the Christians. Two, two options, really, on opposite ends of the spectrum, like an extreme left, extreme right. On one end... The Jew could say, the Christian Jew, or any Christian, Gentiles included, could say, well, 
if the Jews persecute us so much, and you know what, if they kill Jesus, and if they don't want us, and if they're rejecting the Messiah, I suppose now Jesus is doing something that has no reference to Jews, that has no reference to the patriarchs and Abraham, that has no reference to the Old Testament. So let's pile together, maybe burn, maybe scrunch up and throw away the Old Testament. Because we have Jesus now, we don't need Old Testament. We have Jesus now, we don't need the patriarchal promises or anything that came before Jesus. We've got Jesus, stuff that. The other side was that people would say, well, 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 you know what, let's think about it. Let's be reasonable. Does God really want us to suffer and have our heads chopped off? No, you're a child of God. He wants the best for you. He wants a great job for you. He wants peace and blessing for you, just like he wanted for Jesus in his life, amen? And so the Christian, the, the, the left-leaning Christian, would go, no, no, what we need is to realize that, that we and, the, and, and our Jewish brothers and sisters, we worship the same God, and they don't believe in Jesus, but that's okay. We can believe in Jesus in our hearts, And we can avoid church where we'll get persecuted. And what we'll do is we'll shrink slightly and slowly back into the shadows of Judaism. And where they say God, we'll we'll say God, but we'll mean Jesus in our mind. And when they say, cursed be the Christians and the Galileans and the Nazarenes, which is the the way that uh, these people would look at the Christians, they would say, well, blessed be Jesus in their heart. And they'll just be secret Christians. That's a pretty foolproof plan, isn't it? And then eventually, I'm sure, once the persecution died down, they would come out as zealous evangelists and save everybody they had been so cowardly among, right? Cowards love the idea of future boldness. And this is the dual problem. We see different cults or different temptations in the early centuries of the church. Some who want to say, Jesus is better. He doesn't need the Old Testament. Throw it away. Or those who would say, Jesus loves the Old Testament. He preached the Old Testament. He was a Jew. He went to synagogue. I'm going I'm to sneak back into that system. God knows my heart. I don't need to suffer for him or, or be discarded as one who follows him publicly. And to that dual temptation, the writer of the Hebrews says, do not jettison the Old Testament. It's all God's word. And do not jettison worshiping Christ in church Because Christ is better. Yes, you don't have the freedom. You don't have all the gold. You don't have the impressive buildings. You don't have what may seem like the historic legacy and heritage that you would have if you were worshiping in the Jerusalem temple. You don't have this time-tested, proven customs and traditions. Okay, but you have Jesus. And in Jesus, there is everything. This was the historic causes of those early Hebrew Christians' temptations. The writer of the Hebrews wants to tell them there is nothing to go back to even though the building's standing. Even though the priests are standing, and he'll say this in Hebrews 9 and 10, though the priest stands doing his work day by day, sacrificing animals day by day, I know that to go there requires very little faith because you can see it all. I know that to come to church in the catacombs and hide and sneak your way to church and and you're holding a shield up as you're going from the car park into the church building because people want you dead. I know that in here we're in the danky tombs and the tunnels of the Roman Empire and this doesn't look all that glorious, but yet here Christ is exalted, enthroned, and he is with us to bless us. Oh, you need faith to come to church and worship Jesus. It it touched and it tickled that element of, of walking by sight, not faith to go back to the building, the gold, the angels, the inscriptions, the priests, the sacrifices. So the call of the book of Hebrews is that there is nothing to go back to and God would eventually historically underline that fact by sending the general Titus to destroy the building anyway. But before he did, before AD 70, in that first generation of Christianity, God inspired his writer to write or preach this sermon to the Hebrews to tell them the theological truths, not merely the historical truths about the preeminence of Jesus and the uselessness of going back to the Old Testament worship system. So this is the preeminent point of the book of Hebrews. What's the whole book of Hebrews about? It's this. Jesus is superior. He is superior not just to pagan religions and their demon gods. That's a given. Jesus is even superior to the other things that God invented. He's better than everything in creation. That's a given because he made it. Uh, He's better than all of the former prophets. 
His word is better than the prophetic words. His miracles better than the prophetic miracles. His system of worship, his blessings, his salvation, better than the Old Testament systems. And we say, even better than that. But God wrote them. Yes, Jesus wrote them. Now Jesus is here. The message of the book of Hebrews is that Jesus is in every way superior, and that will be our study going through the whole book. But the underlying foundational assumption and assertion of the book of Hebrews is that Jesus is the message of the entire Bible. So the message of Hebrews is Jesus is superior. The basic assumption from which he argues that point is that Jesus is the main message of the entire Old Testament and then into the New. So basically, if you go and read the book of Hebrews, it'd take you about 44 minutes. And it reads like, in fact, it was originally, uh, some believe, and I'm in this camp, it was originally a sermon probably preached by Paul in about the year 60 or 62, probably in Rome towards Hebrews, and it was probably written down by Luke. There's a lot we don't know. What we do know for certain about the authorship of Hebrews is that we don't know who wrote it. But I've got opinions. So Paul was preaching. Now, if I, if I continually say through this series, Paul wrote this, Paul wrote that, forgive me, it's just how I view the book. It's not necessarily a, a gospel. However, the book of Hebrews is, is it reads like it was first a sermon. So there's an introduction And then what he starts doing is just pulling out Old Testament verses and then explaining them and then applying them. And then he'll move on to his next point from the next passage. And it's almost as if he's got his his assistant down here handing him Old Testament scrolls. He puts them down and he continues preaching. This is the the second uh, 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 full, well, maybe second or third, depending on how you read some of them in Acts. This is one of the earliest, I'll say that. One of the first inscribed, transcripted, full Christian sermons we have. We have a couple in Acts, but there are only portions of them. And this one is a 45... So see where I get my model of preaching from. This is a 45-minute sermon. It takes that long to read it, where we just look at the Bible, explain what it means, apply it to our day, and then if you have the goal to stand up and say, you don't just go for 44 minutes sometimes, I would point you to Hebrews, which tells us that he wished he could go on much longer, but time did not allow. Well, time does allow because we got all day, and this is our own building. So that's my defense of my uh, own preaching ministry. But it's interesting to see what he does. He doesn't say, Jesus is better. Get rid of the Old Testament. He says, Jesus is better than the entire Old Testament. Open your Old Testament, which they would have just called the Scriptures, and let me prove it to you from God's breathed word, the Old Testament. So to get into this mindset that the book of Hebrews never wants us to throw out the Old Testament, to get us into this mindset that Jesus is the main point of all of the Bible, including the Old Testament, I want you to go to, uh, uh, turn to uh, Luke chapter 24, and we will uh, pull it apart in just a moment. Paul, uh, or the writer of Hebrews, doesn't just teach that Jesus is the fulfillment, or sorry, that Jesus is better but different to the Old Testament. He teaches that Jesus is the fulfillment of, the climax of, the whole point and the source of glory in the Old Testament. And, this is the tricky thing, that that was the case before Jesus came. Jesus did not arrive and twist the Old Testament or put on some magical angel glasses and make the Old Testament say under a different light that Jesus is the main point of the Old Testament. He came on the scene and said, it's always been about me, haven't you seen? So, Some of the ways that the Bible does this, uh, Old Testament pointing to Jesus. One of the ways it does this is a simple prophecy fulfillment. And this is miraculous. And if you're not a believer today, you don't believe in God, you have a lot of strange answers to try and come up with as to how human beings can write things thousands of years before and they come true perfectly into the distant future. But this is one of the ways that the Bible does it. Let's take Isaiah 53, for example. The messenger of God will come, he will suffer as our servant, he will be punished for sin and then he will make many righteous by dying for them. And then Jesus comes and he fulfills that to a T precisely and exactly. That's prophecy, fulfillment. Sometimes it's not quite as direct or explicit. Sometimes it's what we call type and anti-type or the writer of the Hebrews calls it shadow and fulfillment. That is that something happens in the Old Testament and it really happens 
And it doesn't explicitly say this is a prophecy, but we're meant to see it point to Jesus. This would be like the Exodus story. You read the book of Exodus and you can see the gospel just dripping from its pages, but it nowhere says, and the Messiah will come and do something similar. And yet we're supposed to see it it as a shadow, foreshadowing a glorious uh, substance or the reality. But even, even more than that, just the stories that are written down in the Old Testament, you're supposed to read as pointing to Jesus, even where it doesn't seem to be doing so. We learn this from Jesus in his ministries. He's arguing with the Pharisees. He's, he's rebuking them and he says, just like Jonah was buried in the mouth of the whale, so also the Son of Man will be buried and then rise on the third day. Now, if you're the majority of interpreters in his day or our day, you would say, Jesus, you're actually reading the Bible wrong. There's no messianic prophecies in Jonah. It's just a bitter dude who's kind of racist who runs away, gets eaten and vomited, then runs away again, then gets sent back, preaches a sermon, revival strikes, and then he gets angry about it. There's nothing about the Messiah there. Some people today will tell you that if you're preaching Jonah, you should not be pointing it to Jesus because he's not in there. Jesus disagrees. We should always, at every point, want to have Jesus' view of anything. Jesus has a certain view of history, like the literal flood that happened. I don't care if I disagree with scientists. I want to agree with Jesus. He's, He's the Lord around here. Uh, Jesus has a particular view of the Old Testament that it was written by God, not just man's best attempt at writing stuff about God. Jesus says that was all written by God. Okay, I've got Jesus' view. I'm a Christian. That's part of the thing. When Jesus says, I read Jonah and it's about the Messiah to come, we say, thank you, Jesus, for teaching us what we didn't know, which is how to read the Old Testament. And it's all in light of Jesus. So even the stories are about, you can't read Jonah correctly if you're not reading it as a story that points to Jesus. Now, it really happened. It's not non-history because it's theological. It is true history, but it's just ultimately about Jesus. Jesus taught us this. This is the claim of the New Testament apostles. As as you read the New Testament, sometimes you go, man, it's just so different from the Old Testament. What's the relationship? How should we understand this? I read some parts of the Old Testament. It's just weird. Am I allowed to say? It's odd. It's confusing. The claim of the New Testament apostles is that Jesus is on all the pages of the Old Testament. Not only that Jesus is a new revelation, he does bring new revelation through the apostles, but also that the Old Testament itself bore witness directly to Jesus so that without him, it doesn't make sense. So one professor of theology, Dr. Jagud, says, The Old Testament is not primarily a book about ancient history or culture, though it contains many things that are historically accurate and in ancient cultures. Centrally, the Old Testament is a book about Christ, and more specifically, about his sufferings and the glories that will follow. That is, it is a book about the promises of a coming Messiah through whose suffering God will establish his glorious eternal kingdom. Now, you're in Luke chapter 24, and we're going to show that precisely that is Jesus' own view of the Old Testament. So in Luke chapter 24, and you'll see in uh, verse 25, Jesus, so this is after his resurrection, he's walking with his disciples who didn't recognize that it was him. Don't blame them. They saw him die. It's very valid to not expect to meet them on the road. Uh, so anyway, Jesus is walking with these disciples who don't realize it's him. And he's saying, you know, what's, what's wrong? And they say, well, our, our best pal, the, the, what we thought was the Messiah, he died. And that seems to be enough for Jesus. He says to them, oh, foolish ones. He's so sensitive. He's so gentle, isn't he, Jesus? Uh, my kind of pastor. He says, oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe the, what all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And they were looking at him like you're probably looking at your Bible going, It was not self-evident that that was the case, Jesus. No, no one thought that. But he says, it was so clear, not just because I've told you, it was clear before I told you, so clear, in fact, you're slow of heart and foolish. Wow. It's not God's clarity that's the problem. It's our human sin and ignorance. So he goes on to say, and then, beginning with Moses, that's the first five books of the Old Testament, and all the prophets, that's the rest, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. 
Do you see that he didn't add a commentary onto the Old Testament and said, I'm going to tell you more things about me, kind of like the Old Testament. He says, in the wordings of the Old Testament, there is enough about me to know that I was meant to come, die, rise, and be preached. Or later on in that that chapter, verse 44, then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. I told you this before I was crucified. That everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. That, That should be your prayer every time you come to church. God, please help me. Remove my ignorance. Open my mind to understand the scriptures. That's what we're doing this morning. Lord, open my, uh, they, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and then said to them, thus it's written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. That's a lot to get from just the Old Testament. He didn't have the book of Acts. He wasn't even quoting the gospels. That None of them exist yet. He's saying the writings of the Old Testament showed you this. So John 5 verse 39, you don't need to go there, one verse, but John 5 verse 39 says, when Jesus was debating with the Pharisees who claimed that he was, he was using all this authority that was blasphemous, it wasn't his to take. Only God is authoritative to do what you're doing right now, Jesus. You don't have the authority to do that. Haven't you read Moses? We read Moses, we know the law, we have eternal life and we condemn you. And Jesus says in John 5 39, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is they that bear witness about me. So you have heard of me, Jesus is saying. You you either find me in the law of Moses or you're not reading the law of Moses with spiritually open eyes. So Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons trying to read the Old Testament and deny finding God, Christ's divinity there. They're not reading the Old Testament with open eyes. Your Muslim neighbor, your Jewish friend, they say, we don't believe the new, we hold the old, the prophets, we we believe in that. If they don't conclude that Jesus is the God speaking to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moses, they don't read the Old Testament with open eyes. As Paul says in Corinthians, they are still blinded by a demonic religion and its presuppositions. The Old Testament is a Christian book. It's a Christian book about Jesus, the Christ, and about how his people would believe upon him in his glory. A little bit later in that same chapter, Jesus then says, John 5, verse 46, if you believed Moses, you would believe me because he wrote of me. There's so much packed into that. You can't put Moses against Jesus. Moses points to Jesus. And it's not that Jesus is claiming that after Moses, I can add some on and claim continuity. It's that Jesus says, if all you read was Moses, you would conclude that Jesus the Mas- Jesus of Nazareth from the first century is the Messiah. He's the only one that fulfilled everything Moses wrote. Jesus is on every page of the Old Testament. So that Paul says, I love this, right? Imagine you got called to uh, maybe share a word to um, a a rabbinic group uh, on a Saturday at synagogue, or maybe you were invited to share at a a, a Muslims of University group that, you know, they invited you to share some thoughts, and they told you no preaching from the New Testament. You could say, no worries. Just give me more law and Moses. This is what Paul does. He's giving testimony before the legal council as to his, his heresy. He's made up new heresy. He's blaspheming the Old Testament. As the Christians were accused of in Acts, he's saying things like the law of Moses doesn't apply in the same way anymore. Jesus is going to come back and destroy the temple and they're getting arrested for it. And here's Paul's defense. Acts chapter 26, verse 22. I stand here, he's talking to Agrippa, I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. That the Christ would suffer And that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people, the Jews, and to the Gentiles. Imagine preaching the full gospel in that way and then defending yourself. I'm not touching any New Testament. I'm just reading your scriptures. So is Paul's testimony. So is the apostolic mindset. So is Jesus' teaching because so is the Old Testament. 
Its ultimate point is Jesus Christ. Do good says this again. Then we must interpret the Old Testament correctly. So thus, when we interpret the Old Testament correctly, without allegory or artificial manipulation of the text, but in accordance with Jesus' own teaching, which we were just reading, the central message of every page is Christ. That does not mean that every verse taken by itself contains hidden allusions to Jesus in numbers or stories or names, but that the central thrust of every passage leads us in some way to the central message of the gospel. Jesus, in his own words, in the teachings of the apostles, and the way they then go and write the New Testament letters, we learn Jesus is being preached to us from all of the Old Testament. He is the message of the Old Testament. He is the message of God. He is the central message of God to mankind. Jesus is sometimes in the New Testament, or if we take Hebrews as we close out, here's our last word. Prepare for this. In the book of Hebrews, Paul does one or two things, sometimes both. He says, Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, sometimes by saying he's just like the guys from the Old Testament. So Moses led the people, Jesus led the people. Joshua fought the people onto victory, Jesus fights for us onto victory. Uh, uh, David was a king who ruled over the people, Jesus is a king who rules over the people. Melchizedek was a high priest sent from God, Jesus is a high priest sent from God. And in that sense, we call it the truer. Jesus is the truer Moses, Joshua, David, Melchizedek. He's he's them and better. He's there and he's more them than they were. He's what they were pointing to. He's truer. Sometimes, though, he does it by contrast and he says he's better. For example, yes, Moses was good, but he sinned and couldn't enter the land. But Jesus did not sin at any point and enters the land first and calls us in. Uh, Joshua does this, but he has this lack, but Jesus doesn't. Uh, David does this, but he has lack. Jesus doesn't. The priests do good, but they also offer sacrifices for their own sins. Jesus doesn't. So, so, so the writer of Hebrews says, Jesus is truer than all these men to the message of God. He's also better than them wherever they failed. Whatever they did good, he does better. Wherever they failed, he does better. This is the message of Hebrews in every sense and in every type and in every theme and in every person that we look at, Old Testament, worship, temple, sacrifice, In Old Testament history, the central message is this. Jesus is better than all of them. That means that the ultimate message, the most important message, the driving message that God would give to you today above anything else, any piece of advice he could give, any suggestion he could make, if you woke up this morning, you stumbled into this church, and on your mind was, I want to hear what God would say to me. Here's the good news. No matter who you are, God's message to you, you can be sure of this, is that you must trust in Jesus Christ, and if you do, you will be saved from your sin. The central message that God has to mankind and to you personally is Jesus Christ, his son. Jesus has come into the world he created, took upon himself the sins of his people, the iniquities, the vileness, the uh, disqualifications, the rebellion and the guilt of all of his people, He went before God and suffered the suffering that sin deserves. He took the penalty that sinners deserve. And having died under God's wrath and punishment of the law, he rose again in glorious, indestructible, triumphant life in resurrection. And he is now ascended in heaven, calling home, arms stretched wide, calling to himself in this moment through the word that he wrote in the gospel. He is calling you to believe upon Jesus Christ so that all of your sins can be forgiven and your entire life transformed. Jesus is better and he is infinitely worthy of your trust. Trust in him today and be saved. Let's pray. Father God, what a wonderful book we have ahead of us. And it's, it's glory and it's value and it's wonder finds finds cause and root in this, that it is all about Jesus. Jesus is the glory of the Old Testament. He is the more increased glory of the new covenant. He is the glory of the scriptures. He's the glory of heaven that we wait for. He's the glory of life right now to live with him despite persecution or loss or, or, or bullying that we receive, despite what sacrifice has called on us still to live with Jesus is to live a life of glory.
Oh God, we are in a mean building. We are in a, a, an unglorious uh, structure right now. But we know that if you just gave us a moment to peer into the spiritual realm, we would see ourselves surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, such a host of angels, such shining brilliance and glory because we are touching heaven right now as we worship and preach the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is here with us to benefit, to bless, and to edify those who feast on him by faith. But God, he is also here right now to bring into the kingdom, to bring into his eternal salvation, to bring in to redemption and into heaven any who are not in that salvation right now, who are lost, who are vile, who are sinners, but who are willing to trust into him. We pray, Lord God, that in this very moment, Jesus, you would save souls, give them eternal life, Forgive their sins, change their heart, and bless them, Lord God, we pray. Before we pray all of this in Jesus' wonderful name. And everybody said...